Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. I need to see if this is actually working. I have this idea, okay, so I'm gonna try to watch my own live stream on my phone. Can I, oh, yikes. Okay, it's working, cool. Nice. I was having some technical difficulties getting this set up, not to mention uh, the software was trying to invert the colors of my pictures, which was really creepy. So anyway, um, looks like it's working now. Uh, if you are watching, let me know if you notice any issues. Um, sorry, I'm just rambling. I, I'm trying to wrap up a few things here before I actually start. This is so weird being live. Um, and it started to rain. Okay. So I hope you're all doing well. Like I mentioned, um, Today I'm going to be talking about dystopian classics. This is a video I've been wanting to film for a while. And originally I was just going to do one of my normal rambly podcast things, but... Um, now I'm not sure what's going on because I don't see it changing. Okay, so there's a little bit of lag from what I see versus what's going on. So I'm not going to look at it anymore. Um, again, if you notice anything weird, just let me know. I think it's working. So first let's look at what is dystopian literature. And I'm just going to use Wikipedia here because uh, Wikipedia is my favorite. It's telling me the video resolution is not optimal. I think it's okay, but if you notice any resolution problems, let me know. Um, okay. Dystopian literature. A dystopia is an unpleasant, typically repressive society, often propagandized as being utopian. The Encyclopedia of Science Fiction states that dystopian works depict a negative view of the way the world is supposedly going in order to provide urgent propaganda for a change in direction. Okay. Um, that seems fair enough. I, I don't know if propaganda is necessarily a requirement for dystopian fiction, but let's look at this list here to see some examples. So um, they're saying that it goes back to Gulliver's Travels, and then you've got a few 19th century classics here, and then with the events of the 20th century, seeing a huge amount of what Wikipedia calls dystopian classics. Um, probably inspired by the wars and the effects of the Industrial Revolution. Um, oh, hi Buck. We're just uh, kind of warming up here. I haven't... I kind of just wanted to get a look at what people are calling dystopian literature before jumping into the books that I read. And it's actually really broad. I mean, they're even putting notes from underground on here, which I don't think of that as dystopian, but maybe it is. Um, and there's a few books I read, like The Bee Gums Fortune, which I'm not going to talk about because I honestly don't see them as dystopian. I think there's a certain political uh, element that some of these books don't have that I think uh, makes something dystopian, but I don't know. It's definitely one of those genres you can take in different directions and not necessarily have to have a certain fit.
fixed set of parameters. Um, there's the Iron Heel, which I definitely still want to read. Lord of the World, so yeah. Ton of books in the second half of the century. <laughs> oh boy. Oh uh, yeah. ASMR. <laughs> Yeah, I think of Gulliver as being fantasy, honestly. it's I've never read it, but it seems to me like an absurdist fantasy novel and not so much a, um, I don't know, I, <laughs> I don't think the Lily Puttians are all that threatening, but I haven't read it, so maybe they are. Um, okay, so maybe enough of that. Um, I was going to just go over the books I've read the last three years, three to four years, talk about each of them kind of on a high level, and then maybe compare some of them. Yeah, I think that's where I heard about the Iron Heel from your blog. Um, I really want to read that one. I like London's writing style, and he was definitely socially minded. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would necessarily agree with all of his viewpoints, but he writes so well. I think he could write a very compelling uh, dystopian novel. So let's see, does dystopia require a utopian dream dashed or is it just like bad society is bad? Um, I think that there, so in the books I've read, there's definitely the sense that um, you start out with a utopia or um, some idealized world that a certain segment of the population is totally in favor of and then you've got the protagonists tend to be either fringe people or minorities or um, just strong individualists. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll come back to that in, in view of the books I'm going to talk about. So let me just switch to that now. I was going to actually fill out the spreadsheet live, but... I realized I'd pretty much forgotten a lot of these books, so I went ahead and filled out some stuff. Uh, interesting. I'm just observing that there's kind of a lag between what I'm doing and the actual live stream. It's like almost a minute. That's kind of annoying. Anyway, um, hopefully it won't be a problem. Martin Eden. I've heard of that one. Uh, who wrote that one? Is that also Jack London? Yeah. No, I haven't read that one. I actually have only read The Sea Wolf, which I really enjoyed by Jack London. Um, but yeah, this, this one sounds kind of familiar. Hmm. Um, so I pretty much put this in alphabetical order. I kind of wanted to put it in year of publication because it's kind of interesting to go through in a chronological sense the progression of ideas and and basically the comparison of, you know, how one person viewed a set of events, how another person viewed them, and then how history impacted that um, as it went along. Maybe what I'll do is I'm going to start with, I guess we could do this in chronological order, or we could just start with Pan's Labyrinth, which is kind of, 
I was kind of on the fence whether to include that, but when I read it, it really struck me as dystopian. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I loved the sea wolf. Um, actually, the first time I read it, I was kind of turned off by it, but the second time I thought it was amazing. Um... Okay, I think I'm just going to go in roughly uh, chronological order, but I actually want to talk about Pan's Labyrinth first, so that's kind of the newest story here. This one was written by, well, it was originally a, a movie, and it was written by Del Toro, who's known, known for his horror films, and then a young adult author Cornelia Funk came along later, and she novelized it. So, it's pretty much the newest one. Um, sorry, I'm trying to keep up with the chat here. Um, thanks for tuning in, by the way. I was pretty sure no one was going to be watching this, but <laughs> I might try to do these on Fridays. It just is pretty much the only time that works. Um, yeah, so... The um, Pan's Labyrinth is a fantasy story that takes place in Spain, ruled by General Franco. Um, I want to say this was the 40s. Um, let me look it up real quick. Uh, yeah, roughly speaking. Actually, 1939-1975. Zoom in on the spreadsheet. Okay. Um, let's see. How do I zoom? View, zoom. Yeah, let me know if it's still not legible. Hopefully that'll be... I, I can imagine if you're like trying to view this on your phone, it's probably a nightmare. Um, and what I'll do too is I will post a link to this um, in the description or something when I'm done. Oh, thank you. I don't know if this is going to be nearly as exciting as Red, Dem Red, Dem Red Dead Redemption, but... <laughs> Uh, maybe it'll get exciting as we get into some of the other ones. Um, Pan's Labyrinth, so what is it about? It's about this girl named Ophelia, and she has a special... I mean, she it's kind of like the chosen one trope, so she's got special powers. She's kind of like this reincarnated daughter of a king who lives in the forest slash underworld. And uh, she's kind of reincarnated as this girl whose mother is in love with this Captain Vidal. And he's, um... Oh, uh, I can try changing the latency maybe hmm it doesn't look like i can change it while i'm streaming unless oh maybe in obs i can um let me see here real quick i don't know if that's something i can do on the fly but i can try i can change the bit rate i'm not sure that's a good idea i can zoom in a little more yeah, it is a novelization, and I haven't seen the movie, so... Um, I actually kind of wanted to see the movie, but it's, like, pretty violent, so it's not really my cup of tea. I'll zoom in a little bit more. I don't know if that's going to help, um, but I can play around with some of the other OBS settings, too. Maybe not... Today, um, 
because there's like the settings of the software and then there's the YouTube settings. Um, okay, well, I'll come back to that later. Hopefully this won't be too, too difficult. So, yeah, so her mother, um, Ophelia's, this girl's mother is in love with this Captain Vidal, who's this creepy, psycho, sadistic general or officer in the army. And, uh, basically, the movie is about how Ophelia, who grew up in stories, is relating those stories to her life. Um, dealing with her mother's boyfriend and this mysterious fawn who wants to take her back to the underworld where she, quote, belongs as the daughter of the king. And there's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the gist of it. Um, as far as dystopian elements, um, there is this idea of Franco's Spain being, you know, this new order and um, stamping out the rebellion, but I, I don't know. I was not sure if I should put it on this list. It doesn't really fall into all of the tropes, but it, it was an interesting story and kind of, uh, kind of thought provoking. Yeah, I, I actually read the, um, the IMDB for that, and I'm like, eh, I don't think I'm gonna watch that. But I did, I did think it was worth reading the book. Um, so that's kind of the outlier. Um, what did I think of it? It was a pretty good story, but I felt like the magic could have been better explained. Um, it was okay. I thought the concept was great, just the execution was lacking a little bit. Um, where should we go from here? So maybe we go back to the chronological ordering. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what the tropes are. <laughs> Typically, well, the pattern I'm seeing in a lot of these books is um, you've got a political um, entity which takes over and institutes this whole new way of life and everybody has to fall in line. There's usually one person or a group of people who don't and um, maybe I'll just go back again to this Wikipedia article. Um, I guess, yeah, the, maybe the propaganda is more important than I was thinking at first because usually there's this pattern that almost everybody else is happy in the society except the main character. And that's where the propaganda comes in. Actually, it's a pretty sparse description for such a long list. Maybe if I go to the page for dystopia. <laughs> it literally comes from the Greek for bad and place. So it's a, a bad place. Um, oh, here we go. Dystopias are often characterized by de dehumanization, tyrannical governments, environmental disaster, or other characteristics associated with a cataclysmic de decline in society. I mean, yeah, I don't know. So in a lot of these books I read, I wouldn't say that the society was collapsing. It was more like um, societal values were coming to an end, whether they were values of family, trust, that kind of thing. But as a functioning unit or political entity, I, I'm not sure that they were actually all declining. Some of them were, for sure, but yeah, this is interesting. Uh, do I have a favorite magic system? 
I don't really, I haven't really read a lot of magic or books with magic, I mean. Um, I would say I just like it to be either completely absurdist, surrealist, um, completely like, you know, Alice in Wonderland where there's not really any rhyme or reason to it. I like it to be either entirely like that or entirely logical. Like, I mean, I think the Narnia series is pretty logical. I think there's some elements that aren't necessarily logical, but for the most part, he was trying to show cause and effect there pretty effectively. Okay, so... I'm just sort of catching up on some comments here. Um, all right, let me go back to the spreadsheet. So the the next earliest, or I should say, we're starting over now. Uh, the earliest book here is Lord of the World by John Hugh Benson. This was one of the first ones I read and it happens to be one of the first published. Um, so John Hugh Benson was a Catholic, Catholic priest. Originally he was Anglican, but uh, he converted at some point. And actually that was big news at the time because he came from a Catholic or a, sorry, Anglican family. So it was a big deal for him to convert. Hey, that's okay. Thanks for tuning in for the short time. And, you know, it'll be here later so you can watch it later if you want. I just realized I was wearing my headphones and they're not even plugged into anything. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm going to try to pick this pace up a little bit. It's already 7.30. Yeah, so both the popes, the both the recent popes recommended this book. Um, I think Pope Benedict called it a good example of New World Order, and then uh, Francis called it ideological colonization, uh, which is actually a really interesting phrase. Um, so a lot of these books are written by British guys, and they take place in England, unsurprisingly. In this world, there's uh, three major countries or entities, America, Communist Europe, and the quote, Eastern Empire, which is China and Japan combined. And the story is, uh, it's kind of a retelling of Revelation combined with some personal elements. So there's this member of parliament named Oliver Brand and his mother is returning to the Catholic faith. And in the meantime, his wife is becoming more and more despairing over, I guess, life. I mean, I can't remember exactly why she was feeling depressed, but um, those two things are kind of going on. And then that's how that's how this father, Percy Franklin, who's the main character, gets to know Oliver Brand through this mother who's, I think, uh, I think it was secretly she's trying to come back into the church. <clears throat> um, let's see here. So the antagonists in this one, there's this antichrist figure, Julian Felsenberg, and then the Freemasons are interestingly one of the antagonist groups. Um, it seemed like uh, at the time, the Catholics were pretty concerned about the Freemasons, which I guess it's kind of hard to view them as a threat today, but this is kind of an interesting historical perspective. Um, overall, I thought this was a surprisingly futuristic book. I was impressed by all the things he predicted, like um, airstrikes and kind of this, I would say, worship of nature or nature's laws. A um, couple things I don't feel like were quite on point were the 
he saw um he foresaw christians like leaving the church in the sense of like pastors abdicating um versus secularization of churches which i think is where we're at and also this idea of truth being replaced with another truth versus corruption of truth it might be semantics but i think that um i think things have gone a slightly different route than he predicted um i just threw a bunch of thoughts down honestly one thing i will say is that i don't think this book will appeal to everybody but it's kind of interesting if you are a catholic um or if you're not a catholic i mean i'm not but it's interesting reading a catholic priest's perspective on all this and yeah i i think it's a worthy dystopian classic just not everyone's cup of tea okay um what comes next so Looks like uh, the machine stops. This was just a short story by E.M. Forster. E.M. Forster, who wrote Howard's End and A Passage to India and A Room with a View. Um, just a short little story about life in the future. Um, this was just my mini book review on here. Basically, I, I thought it was a good story, actually. It mostly focuses on this disconnect between family members because they're just communicating through technology. So, pretty relevant, actually. Um, just a short story. I think you can find it online if that interests you. Uh, what else? I think the next one would be... Oh, I forgot Paris in the 20th century. Technically, that one comes first because Jules Verne wrote it in 1863. And it was basically forgotten until 1994. So even though it takes place in 1964, um, it, it was published much later. So it's kind of weird reading this futuristic book <laughs> that actually was published after the future that it's, it, that's in the book. Um, anyway... Just sort of checking a few things here on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, Paris in the 20th century. Um, that's where it's set. It's about this young guy, uh, Michel, who just graduated from college and trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life. Uh, tries to get a job. Doesn't like the jobs available. Uh, generally does not have a good time. And... Let's see here. So yeah, a coming of age story. That's weird. The cell is just moving. Um, yeah. Thoughts? I've read this twice, actually. It's a very poignant book. It's very sad, very depressing. Um, Jules Verne talks a lot about breakdown of family, uh, breakdown of morals, a change in culture going from like arts and literature and things and now having a huge emphasis on uh, computers and technology and electronic music and things like that. And uh, the end of the book is actually pretty bleak. It's kind of unusual for Vern. Um... This is not a book that really is particularly gripping in terms of the story or the characters. It's more about this, these predictions that he made. So, uh, somewhat interesting. Not, not necessarily my favorite. Uh, let's see, the next one would be... Yeah, so we should have started with that one, but anyway. Uh, we've got We by this Russian author, Yevgeny Zamyatin. Uh, again, one of those that wasn't published when it was written. Uh, it was published in 1988, but first written in the 20s. 
This is a very classic dystopian setup. You've got this one state, literally called one state. Uh, you've got these people that are named or called by these code names. So D503 is the main character. He's an engineer. Um, he's got a wife named O90, and he falls in love with I330. <laughs> And I just put these terms here. Uh, these are actually, speaking of Jack London, um, Jack London had these concepts, uh, literary concepts of the mother girl and the mate woman. So these two female characters fall into those tropes. Um, and most of the book is basically about that that love triangle because O90 loves her husband. Well, basically husband. And then, you know, D... D is obsessed with I, and so on. Um, that's basically the story, to be honest. There is this concept of the green wall. So these people live in this very advanced society, um, very clean and sterile, minimalist, futuristic, basically what you'd see in a movie. And then there's this green wall, and then there's, like, these other people living outside of that, which the book doesn't really talk about that much, but I thought that was kind of interesting. In fact, that is very similar to Brave New World, because in Brave New World, you've got the advanced uh, cities, and then you've got these, you know, reservations where the, quote, primitive people live. Um... I think I'm fighting off a cold. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just some thoughts I was throwing on the page. Um, this book is beautifully written. I love the 20s because um, in the 20s, you're transitioning from that almost stilted Victorian Edwardian prose and then you're also throwing in that edgy po post-war vibe, which, you know, the 20s kind of meets in the middle and you've got some of both. I, I really like that. Um, yeah, this was one of those books that had some religious imagery in a twisted sense. Um, the, the quote bad guys here are the benefactor and the guardians who just make sure everybody stays in line. I thought it was a pretty good book. I wasn't really big on the whole romance triangle, but I'm sure that would appeal to some people. And it was very well written. And I think of these books, just a really good representation of what a dystopian novel is like and really hits on a lot of the common themes across all of these. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to that, but that's kind of kind of where I, where, what I took from that. Um, so the next one would have been, let's see, looks like it's Brave New World. Okay, so Huxley, Brave New World, uh, 1932, also set in a version of England. Uh, what is it about? It's about this guy named Bernard, and he's about to lose his job. So he looks for an opportunity to distinguish himself in some way, and ends up meeting this guy, John. who lives on a reservation. Brings him back to the quote, modern world. And basically exploits him because everybody's, you know, curious about him and about, you know, way, the way he perceives things. John is kind of an interesting character. He grew up reading Shakespeare. And um, 
So, so from Shakespeare, John finds his sense of right and wrong and the way he thinks society should be. So when he comes to this, this version of England, um, where people are basically, they're, um, created in test tubes and they are genetically modified to fulfill certain roles in society. And so that's completely contrary to everything that this John has been reading about from boyhood. So he doesn't understand any of this stuff and he has the misfortune, I guess, of falling in love with this Lenina who Bernard is also in love with. Um, surprisingly, Huxley doesn't really focus on that love triangle. It's more about John and him discovering this world. And uh, yeah, this is one of the more famous ones that I've read. Um, people tend to love it or hate it. I thought it was surprisingly relatable in some ways. Um, the thing about Huxley's dystopia is that everybody is more or less happy. This is not a dictatorship in the sense that, you know, they're rounding people up and forcing them to do things. Um, this is more of a highly structured society, which has been both propagandized and brought up to think a certain way and to want certain things. <clears throat> so, yeah. That that kind of sets this book apart from the others. I mean, it's not that the others don't have characters who are quote happy, but this book particularly highlights the fact that um, people have been taken over by the, I guess, just this inherent acceptance of the way things have changed and also, you know, the comforts of life and so on. And most of the characters have very comfortable lives, very affluent, um, affluent careers and so forth. So they don't have any particular reason to uh, be resistant against the government. And so you'll often see conversations about this book versus 1984, where people are more seemingly miserable. And so I actually think that Huxley's world is more realistic it's not that you're not going to see, I mean, it's not like you're not going to see situations like 1984. I mean, there's definitely examples of that in the real world. But as far as the, the, um, I mean, as far as for those of us in the West, we might see something more like Huxley's vision of dystopia. <coughs> All right, so... There's that. Um, this is going a lot longer than I thought it would, actually. Let me go down to the next one here, which is That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis. So C.S. Lewis wrote this science fiction trilogy, and That Hideous Strength is the last book in the trilogy, but ironically, it doesn't really have much to do with the other two books. It's also set in England, and it follows this married couple, Mark and Jane, who are going through some marital difficulties. Um, Mark works at this um, college, which is affiliated, or not affiliated, there's some business deal going on between the college and this National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. Um, and it's taking a lot of Mark's time He's working a lot. He's not really spending quality time with Jane. And Jane starts to have weird nightmares as well. 
um, yeah, the N-I-C-E, <laughs> um, very subtle, uh, yeah, this was a difficult book for me, I remember that it took me a long time to review this book, I really, I, I, I liked the beginning, but I really hated the ending, um, I can link to my full review of it, it's great in the terms of the dystopian world that he paints, because unlike some of these other books, C.S. Lewis takes you from this charming, quaint English village and these seemingly harmless uh, professors and stuff. He starts you out in that kind of idyllic situation, and then he leads you gradually towards this dystopia where um, academia and government come together and turn the world upside down and completely ruin this charming village, um, both ecologically and morally and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's a conspiracy thriller, um, speaking of thrillers. It covers a lot of topics of, you know, the 1940s, um, which I've kind of outlined here ethnic cleansing, Superman, uh, charisma, and then brute force taking over innocent people, um, conquest of death, so this seeking eternal life, but not through religion, rather through science or through uh, um, just devious means. Um, so... <laughs> There's a legend that um, J.R.R. Tolkien, so the author of Lord of the Rings, called this that hideous book, um, partly because, well, he may not have agreed with Lewis's handling of the supernatural elements. I don't really know the full details, but one of the things Lewis does in this book is try to tie in his mythos of these like alien angel things with Tolkien's Middle Earth. And I think that might have been his mistake. Um, it's always risky taking other people's uh, creations and blending them with your own. And I, I don't think Lewis meant it in a wrong way. I'm sure he was trying to be flattering, but I don't think Tolkien was necessarily happy with that. All right. Um, I really, yeah, the part that really ruined this book for me was kind of that weird mythos that I mentioned, um, blending Christianity and the King Arthur legend and these alien angels. Uh, even more disturbing to me was the way he portrayed the character of Jane and kind of making her out to be an antagonist and just not a good person when really... There was nothing in the book that I thought made her particularly faulty compared to Mark. Um, yeah, just, I had various issues with this book. The dystopian elements were very well written. I really enjoyed how he showed the progression of normal life to dystopia. So, in that sense, it's worth reading, but other than that, I just can hardly recommend it. Okay, so that's that hideous strength. Um... The next one would be 1984, which most people have read. Again, we're back in jolly old England, uh, now called Airstrip One. And similarly to Benson's Lord of the World, you've only got a few uh, countries here. Let's see if I can pull that up. So we've got... Oceania, which this little airstrip one slash England is part of. You've got Eurasia, which is, well, you can see it's basically Europe and Russia combined. And then you've got the Asian countries kind of lumped together in this East Asia. So strikingly similar to Benson's Lord of the World universe. Um... Yeah, the main character, well, 
Again, you've probably read 1984, so I won't go into it too much. Uh, but we've got Winston Smith, who is kind of an everyman, and he doesn't really enjoy life. Um, he does meet this girl named Julia, and they hit it off, and she's very much a person who resists against the uh, socialist slash um, authoritative authoritarian government of Airstrip One. So they really hit it off and it's kind of about their relationship and how it leads to them being found out. Um, so he gets found out as being this person resisting against the government. Um, of course, big brother is now a common term for um, mass surveillance. Uh, that's That plays heavily in this book, obviously. You know, I didn't really love 1984. <laughs> I know a lot of people do, so I felt kind of weird about that. Um, I just... I don't know. I just didn't love the characters. I didn't love the conflict. Um, now, one thing I will mention about Winston is similarly to this D-503, uh, Winston plays a fairly important role in this government. He is a... Basically, he works in the censorship department. He helps to rewrite articles and things. At least that's what I recall. So he plays a pretty critical role. So it's it kind of adds to the the tension of whether he's going to get fi found out or not. As opposed to, say, Percy Franklin in Lord of the World, or Ophelia, or even Mark. I mean, these people are more little, little people, so to speak, that don't... Uh, by little, I mean their roles are not very big in the grand scheme of things. So, you might think that they have less to, uh, or, or they're, they're just less at risk of getting found out, I guess is how to put it. Although, Mark gets increasingly entangled in, in things. Um, let's see, it's already 7.56. Uh, where, where, where are we? <laughs> so, we just finished talking about 1984. Um, did I hit all of them? I actually think I did. Okay. Uh, someone mentioned on Instagram Fahrenheit 451. I haven't actually read that one. I should. Um, I don't know why I haven't. Ray Bradbury, I have read like a short story by him. But he's a very famous science fiction author. I'm just about to lose my voice here. Okay. So what do I want to talk about now? Um, just sort of to wrap it up, I guess. So some of the themes here, um, obviously materialism and wealth, especially in Brave New World. When people get really comfortable, they get less, uh, you know, less, less anxious to change their way of life, if that's all they know. Um, false purity, yeah, we see that in a lot of these. This, uh, this idea that there is, as Wikipedia says... Oh, where are we? Where are we? I actually it was on the other page, wasn't it? Uh, propaganda, propagandized as being utopian. So, giving people something bad disguised as something good. And that, that definitely comes up a lot here. Um, Socio-political movements. A lot of that in that hideous strength. Um, I'm trying to think if any of the other books really had stuff like that. Can't, I'm not sure. Uh, paper. <laughs> so a lot of these books were trying to be futuristic. I noticed a lot of them still used paper for a lot of things. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, a couple of them had some interesting dining tables that either dropped from the ceiling or popped up from the floor. It's always fun. Uh, segregation versus in integration. So some of these books, you'll see... So, so, bleh. 
I'm sorry. Some of these books, you'll see that society is pretty segregated, such as Brave New World, where you've got this elaborate caste system. Um, in other books, I would say things are more integrated. Um, maybe, maybe that hideous strength is a good example. Um, this is a big one, romance, for a lot of these books. Especially We, That Hideous Strength, um, 1984 is like the main, it's the main feature there. So that's really, really a, a huge thing. This idea, not just of romance, but family, interpersonal connections being threatened by the collective, right? Um, other themes... Race actually is a big theme of a lot of these books. Again, Brave New World, I keep going back to that, but you've got that artificial caste system and uh, some of these other books too talk about race. Um, I'm trying to remember. I know that We has some of that in there and not always in positive terms. Uh, other themes... You know, that's one, one thing that's kind of interesting is obviously Pan's Labyrinth has a loss of innocence. I would say Paris in the 20th century does as well. These both kind of focus on younger characters, children or young adults. And growing up in a time where you're seeing these negative changes in your world, that that is a big... Um, has a big effect on your character. Um, another thing, of course, is the idea and sort of c kind of hand in hand with loss of purity, or I should say false purity. Um, uh, what am I, what is the word I'm looking for? It's Replacements for religion? That's not really the way I want to phrase it, but essentially, um, I'll just write out replacement for religion, because uh, that is that is what I mean. So either atheists or other groups um, supp uh, posing as replacements for Christianity, for Eastern religions, all those kind of things. Um, what else here? I think that's basically all I want to say at this point. Um, without, you know, going any deeper. Let me switch over to this tab. So, what I did was I took my numbering from this spreadsheet. I put it into a random number generator and I thought I would try to do like a tournament style thing. Try to figure out which of these books I liked the best. So this is sort of arbitrary, but it'll, it'll more or less be the best. So between Pan's Labyrinth and The Machine Stops, I mean, those aren't super comparable. I would say... The Machine Stops is good, but it is a short story, and I don't feel like I really connected with the characters. I definitely connected with Ophelia, so I'm going to say Pan's Labyrinth wins that one. Between We and Paris in the 20th Century, that's actually very challenging because I have read this book twice or maybe even three times and I've only read We once, but We left a huge impression on me in terms of the writing style and, you know, this kind of surrealist immersion in the story. Whereas Paris in the 20th Century, I identified very much with the main character, Michel, and his struggle to fit in in the modern world. So I'm not really sure. I think I might have to give that to Paris. But I do think We is pretty good. I don't know. I think I'm going to give it to Paris.
those two are very, very close for me. Um, let me see here. So, Lord of the World 1984. Okay, that's... I, I think I'm going to say Lord of the World because even though I didn't remember a ton from it as I went back and reviewed my reviews, uh, I was impressed how much he predicted about the modern world and, you know, he wasn't right on everything, but it was just very insightful. I just really disliked 1984, so it's hard for me to give that a high ranking in any case. So I'm going to say Lord of the World here. Uh, Brave New World, Hideous Strength. Again, kind of tough because I kind of hated the ending of Brave New World and I also hated the ending of that Hideous Strength. Uh, Brave New World went into really bizarre territory at the end. I mean, the whole book is really bizarre, but it's humorous until you get to the end. And the then the end is kind of like Lord of the Flies, where you've got everybody just acting crazy. Uh, that hideous strength had such good qualities in the first half and so many bad qualities in the second half. I don't know. I think, well, I guess I'm going to say Brave New World. Although, on the other hand, it was really cringy in some parts. I don't know. I'm going to say, oh man. I don't know which book I like less or more. Let's give it to that hideous strength. Although, I, I don't know. It's like the lesser of two, two weevils here. Uh, okay. So, Pan's Labyrinth versus Paris in the 20th century. I'm going to have to give this one to Paris because I was very dissatisfied with some of the resolution in Pan's Labyrinth. So, Paris in the 20th century, it is. Lord of the World versus That Hideous Strength, well, I'm going to have to say Lord of the World because it was just better overall, even though it was pretty flawed in some respects. And then finally, Paris in the 20th Century versus Lord of the World. That's actually kind of tough because, I don't know, again, there's so, so many good things in Lord of the World, but there's also a lot of good things in Paris. Of these two, I will just say that probably this book has more more of what I well hmm. I don't know I think I'm gonna give it to Paris so yeah this was really kind of less than exciting in the end but Paris in the 20th century is my favorite of all of these which incidentally is kind of ironic because I wouldn't say it's the most exciting of all of these books it's just the one that I liked the most overall. Okay, so that pretty much sums up everything I had for dystopian literature. Um, thanks so much to everyone who tuned in. And if you have any comments, suggestions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll leave it open for a little bit after I turn this off. Um, or you can leave a comment and I'm gonna try to post the this spreadsheet in the description. Maybe even make it editable. I don't know if I want to do that. Maybe I'll just post it. Um, I'm just trying to think if I have any final thoughts. I think for my final thoughts, I just want to say that I have not read a dystopian novel that I absolutely thought was like a five-star book. I actually tried to write my own <laughs> several years ago before I read many of these books, and I must say it was uh, not easy, not easy, because a lot of these things have already been written in TV and book and movie, like, ad nauseum. It's hard to come up with anything truly original, which is why you do see a lot of the same types of stories, even across these books. Um, I... 
I think it's a good genre, but I think part of the problem with it is you can go too far in the sensational side of things, and you're also very much, I think, tied to whatever era you're living in. That's That seemed pretty clear to me from these books, anyway. Each author seemed to be talking about the world they lived in, even when they were trying to be futuristic. And that makes sense. It's just that I think there's a certain limitation there, um, which you could certainly try to overcome. But then if you go too far away from what is familiar, then it is difficult for people to it's it just becomes fantasy at that point it's and it's hard for it to hit home for people so i don't know um tricky genre i don't know that we ever answered the question of what it is um or like yeah i don't feel like we decisively figured that out I think my takeaway is it's almost like viewing history through a different perspective, through a fictional perspective, and uh, not necessarily, I don't know, not necessarily tied to specific, well, I don't know. There's certainly specific tropes, but it's not necessarily the same ones. It kind of depends uh, what you're dealing with at the current moment and how you're trying to convey that. So yeah, I'm starting to ramble. Uh, I think I'll wrap it up here. Thanks again for watching and I will see you next time.